Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and distinguished guests. It's my tremendous honor to chair this family office, Triple Bottom Line Investing Virtual Roundtable on behalf of the prestigious Harassus Extraordinary Meeting 2020. The purpose of this discussion is due to the substantial growth of family offices over the past 10 to 15 years, which has measured an approximate tenfold increase according to a recent ENY study. Furthermore, Social impact investments are a growing alternative investment category amongst individuals, family offices, and at an institutional level. The ESG, or environmental, social, and corporate governance aspects, are central factors in measuring sustainability and societal impact of an investment and, we're now, and are now playing a more vital and growing role in the decision-making process of family offices and institutions. John Elkington in the 1990s coined the phrase triple bottom line, and that refers to the social, environmental, and financial components. This is a particularly hot topic amongst next generation children of ultra wealthy families and inheritors, and a key consideration uh, when it comes to succession planning and wealth transfer in alignment with their core values. As an example, one uh, study uh, discusses how there was a transfer of over 30 trillion, there will be a transfer of $30 trillion from one generation to the next. And another says there will be a transfer of in excess of 60 uh, plus trillion uh, from one generation to the next by uh, 2060. This is important and quite pivotal uh, as family offices and ultra high net worths are playing that imperative role of fueling initial growth of social impact and triple bottom line investing as they are often the initial investors that have that 1 million, 5 million, 10 million, and in rarer cases, 20 million, 50 or 100 million plus um, to put into an initial investment uh, and, and fuel this, this, this growing segment where institutions may consider the, the allocation too small or not aligned with their uh, investment criteria or risk criteria. Therefore, it's my tremendous pleasure to introduce the focus of our discussion and it, which is triple bottom line investments for family offices. Family offices play a pivotal role in social impact, ESG and triple bottom line investments. These types of investments are presented to family offices on a daily basis. How do family offices choose investments that align with their core values and, and, and vision? What red flags repel them as being mere promotional hype and greenwashing by asset managers and promoters? Well, now, without further ado, it's my tremendous pleasure to introduce our distinguished uh, five panelists. Firstly, from the United States of America, Kevin M. McGovern, who is founder of McGovern Capital, a single family office. Welcome, Kevin. Good, good afternoon and good morning from the USA. A pleasure. Uh, David Mayer de Rothschild, who is founder of Voice of Nature, uh, based out of the United Kingdom. Welcome, David. Hello, everybody. Uh, Richard Sobel is managing partner of Altai Capital based out of Russia and the United States of America. Okay, a single family office. And uh, Joseph Hernandez, who is an impact uh, investor and entrepreneur based out of the United States of America with multiple ventures. Welcome, Joseph. Delighted to be here. Thank you. And Helena Montgomery, who is principal of Montgomery Investments USA. Welcome, Helena. Good morning, everybody. Okay. Well, look, uh, I could give uh, an introduction to all of you because you've all got some very, very unique uh, talents and perspectives that uh, and, 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 and very intriguing views that we'd love to share. But rather me give the introduction on who you are. I'd love in about 90 seconds if you could kindly share with us a little bit about your background and what interested and connected with you to take the quantum leap of becoming part of the uh, triple bottom line social impact investing world. Kevin, why don't we start with you? Thank you very much, Peter, and thank you all the organizers for this opportunity. The Govern Capital is a single family office. We're located in New York, Greenwich, Connecticut, and Coral Gables in Florida. I'm presently in Coral Gables. Basically, we are social and serial entrepreneurs. Uh, we have founded uh, eight category of world leaders, mainly in healthcare consumer technologies. 
our mantra basically is catch the current and make the wave. So we like to create and make the opportunities as we see it. We're great philosophers following a, a hockey player named Wayne Gretzky. We skate to where the puck will be. And currently we're involved in a couple dozen investments, uh, about 25, and all of them relate to healthcare and wellness. Some relate to what we consider the largest challenges in healthcare today. One is removal of plaque from your blood system. There's nothing that does that, and we're working on a technology that does. We work with plant-based foods, and we're working with providing health care, uh, personal health care in your homes. My background is very, very modest. I come from an Irish immigrant family, and so I've experienced the effectiveness of kindness and generosity in the way it makes a difference, particularly to me as a trustee currently at Cornell uh, I always say to Cornell, I, I had a full scholarship and I'll never let it forget it. So we come from a modest background and we like to do good, first of all, and make money uh, from doing good. Thank you. Brilliant. And David, how did you find yourself uh, immersed and, and part of the new triple bottom line social impact investing world? Well, thank you to everyone for organizing this. And obviously, it's an honor to be on this panel. Um, my background actually is, um, I come from a slightly different angle, I should say. I'm a naturopath, um, I did a degree in natural medicine. So I quickly became connected to the understanding how a relationship in nature was really understanding our relationships to ourselves. Um, I set up a foundation which really focused on um, trying to close the gap on our misunderstanding um, between humans and nature and doing that through creative storytelling, expeditions, investing. Um, and so I've really been in the space now for... Um, almost two decades, so I'm starting to age myself. Um, and obviously coming from a background of, um, which was really steeped in, in, in banking, um, you know, and being in some way, I would say, you know, everyone loves to call you a black sheep, but I would say maybe I'm a multicolored sheep um, because I'm, you know, doing many things. Um, you know, um, it, it's really given me an opportunity to sort of play in this world of impact um, investing, but also really to persuade corporations about how to change their business models. So I have a huge funnel of opportunity to see um, all types of investments um, and all the way through to, you know, really trying to persuade um, and, and not, now not so much, but persuade individuals to change their mindsets on their role in the web of life. So um, I, you know, I personally invest. I said earlier off, offline that I'm probably the only one on here who doesn't have the structure of a big family office around him. I'm a passionate investor in things that I believe in. Um, and if they're connected yeah. to nature, um, wow. connected to the impact of uh, wellness on the planet and people, then I'm interested. That's brilliant. And Rich, how did you find yourself uh, interested and then focused on the social impact aspects of investments? Because you've come from a traditional background of investing, but now uh, on triple bottom line. So I'd love to hear your views, Rich. Well, just by way of background, I'm an American who found himself in Russia in the early 1990s where I was involved in setting up and running private investment funds, first for Bearings and then for Alpha Group. That was a pretty heady period. There wasn't a lot of structure. Uh, there was a tremendous excitement, a palpable excitement that was unleashed after the collapse of the kind of Eastern Bloc, Soviet Union, communism. And we were quite uh, fortunate to be able to participate in providing capital and helping entrepreneurs build businesses and take those businesses to the next stage. And although it was difficult and there were setbacks and there was money lost from time to time, um, and it wasn't always very flattering, it was quite inspiring to be able to do well and do good at the same time. And so for some of those periods, Russia was one of the most dynamic markets in the world. Unfortunately, as you all know, that is no longer the case. And so I've been running a family office for the last six years for the largest agriculture meat producer in the former Soviet Union. Um, it's led by a second generation who studied in the United States and they care deeply about issues of ESG. And so we've come to the decision that this is a very big in, enduring uh, dynamic opportunity that we're trying to participate in. And so we're seeing again an opportunity where you can do well and do good at the same time. And so <clears throat> I guess, um, you know, we're not, um, we're, we're interested in the TBL, this triple bottom line, because we believe that it offers opportunities where we can achieve our financial objectives, but do a lot more. And within that, there are four areas 
that sort of speak to their values. One is the ag-related food, healthy food. Another is health and wellness. A third is in renewable energy. And a fourth happens to be in affordable housing. But as you can imagine, a large meat producer in the former Soviet Union has a lot of externalities. And so we take some mm -hmm. sense of responsibility in getting involved in doing things that are more positive. And we've learned a lot. So I would say we're maybe less knowledgeable than some of the others on the panel. And I hope that my participation, our ability to find our way will send some signal to others who are on the kind of listening that you don't have to be a super expert to get started. So thank you. Thank you. And Joe, um, I'm, I'm very familiar with your entrepreneurial uh, background, particularly in the healthcare industry. I remember our, our discussions in, in, in Davos earlier this year. I'd love to hear about your entrepreneurial background and how you've started to transition and be involved in the triple bottom line social impact side. Yeah, wonderful. Well, again, thank you for the invitation to be here. Delighted and honored to be amongst this very prestigious group of people. I, I feel humbled. So thank you for that. Um, my, my story is, is a very simple one. I am a son of uh, Cuban immigrants that came to the U.S. and said, listen, we're going to give you only one thing, and that's education. And what you do with that is you succeed, you raise your kids, you educate them, and then you give back. And that was the way we were raised in our household. So uh, luckily, I've been successful in some of my ventures. Some have failed. We don't talk about the ones that fail. We forget about those really quickly, obviously. But we've had some successes. And um, the, the mantra in all those investments, which primarily I founded the technologies that found the companies, was the first capital in and ultimately stayed in as long as the, as long as the big investors would allow me to do. So we, we've done that successfully, and we've done it with a number of companies in healthcare, Two of, more, two of our more recent uh, investments, which I think follow this mantra, is uh, we actually were one of the first ones to start a COVID-19 vaccine. Uh, and when we did that, we did it under the premises that we would uh, allocate vaccinations to third world countries that couldn't afford it because we knew they couldn't afford it. And and we were very sensible about that. That's still the strategy with, with that company. Uh, I Also, we uh, agreed to use technologies that were uh, known traditional ways of uh, using adjuvants. Right now, a lot of people don't know this, but most of the leading vaccines right now either use ad adjuvants that have never been tried in humans. So that's where you're seeing a lot of these failure rates. Or the chain of custody is incredibly difficult to distribute to third world countries that require negative 80, 4 degrees. These are um, supply logistics that don't exist in third world countries where this this vaccine is needed, really. Um, so that's one investment that we've done where we sort of thought about all these three elements. It has to be the financial first. You have to have a return on investment. Investors yeah, come we'll, we'll, we'll get into the criteria in a minute, um, um, uh, Joe. So don't worry. Hold your horses. You'll, you have more. Oh, I will highlight that. Uh, the, the, the last, the, the, the last recent year that we've been involved in, we actually spun out a company out of Oxford University uh, in the area of universal flu vaccine. And, and the purpose for that was to, uh, in fact, provide universal flu, and then we agreed that we would provide it to third world countries at cost. So those are kind of the investments we, we, we really scoop. They're, you know, they're very sort of economically sustainable and viable and, and also have these broader impacts. And that's what our primary focus is. And right now we're working on a stack to go and effectively acquire companies that are in a later stage, $200 million plus, that have these kinds of criteria to make a bigger impact. Okay, thank you very much, Joe. And Helena, I'm very familiar of, uh, of your background, both from the family office world, entrepreneurially, and also from impact, but I'd love to share your evolution in about 90 seconds uh, on, on, on the direction you're taking now and a bit about your, your background that led you here. Helena. Yeah. Hello? Can you hear me well? Now we can hear you, yes, go ahead. Ah, okay, sorry. Um, economist, statistician, computer scientist, I'm all about um, how things happen and uh, things that are on boots on the ground, figuring out how to deploy technologies to help humankind. Um, it's all about how much time we have on, on this earth. We have a lot of, it sounds nice, but it really is true. 
money can be made, um, you know, made a lot of money for other people and myself for in many different areas and different projects. And I realized that um, it's easy for the economic part of it. Um, but what, are, what about the other thing? It's easy to, now, because it's easy to make the money, um, it's now up to us to make the choice to have uh, choose those projects that help the environment, help human beings. Um, we're working on projects to um, digitize and uh, logistics and uh, drones. And it isn't all about technology. It's about how is it going to apply to human beings and how to improve our uh, our lot, how to um, bring carbon out of the air, um, how to wound heal. These are some of the projects that are in my portfolio and I'm working on to get out there so that people can enjoy it and use it. Mm -hmm. Brilliant. Excellent. Now, look, an, another key area, and, and this is where uh, many of us have different perceptions um, about the market, but what are your thoughts on the present state of the market of social impact and triple or bottom line investments that are being presented to family offices as investment off opportunities? Kevin? To give you uh, some comments, I have to tell you that one of our key categories is we've been a leader in clean water. Uh, one of our companies created the pure filter for Procter & Graham Gamble. Uh, we also created the first refrigerator filter for Electrolux, and I dedicated a good part of my life uh, to bringing clean water around the world. So that background having said, I have to tell you that I think, unfortunately, in my opinion, state the state of, of the market is too much talk and not a lot of action. Let me give you an example. You know, when you're digging a well in Africa, everybody's talking about digging wells in Africa. You ever test the water? I ask these organizations. And so often they say no. And I say, well, you may be creating more problems than you're curing. Look at Bangladesh. They created a terrible cancer problem by digging wells into arsenic. And so what's happening is you find that lots of people are talking and, and they're just not doing it. And, and we, we've changed our focus a lot now to focus on more local opportunities not just in the United States, but in places where we can travel to and we can have a better say in what's going on. I was a keynote at Opal uh, about two years ago, opening keynote, and my, my pitch, my, my, my whole story was, you know, when you're looking at entrepreneurial uh, companies like we've been involved in many, 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 you do a lot of due diligence. But when you're looking at charitable situations, philanthropic situations, do you do the same due diligence? Do you get out in the field? Do you just visit the headquarters and not visit the field? Not only do you put boots on the ground, do you get your boots dirty? Do you really find out? Have you walked to Ravi in, in Mumbai? Have you really seen what these people are doing? And if they're not doing it, don't invest. One last story. I'll never forget this. Yeah, yeah okay, okay, Kevin, we'll, we'll, have, to, we'll have, to, have to do that in summary. So if you keep it quick, that'd be great. Okay, all I'm saying is some of these charitable organizations have too much money because they're paying too much. I really think we all have to really fight to make sure that everybody's doing the effective job they say. Yeah. And David, what is your thought on the state of the market of investments uh, in the impact and triple bottom line space that are being presented to family offices and institutions? What do you think the, the state of the market is, the caliber of investments? What are your thoughts on it, David? Yeah, I mean, I mean, from what I'm seeing, from my viewpoint, I, I feel like, you know, there's a, it, it's definitely, um, it's a hot space. I mean, everybody's talking about it. ESG seems to be popping up all over the place. There's a lot of movement. The question is, how are people moving? What steps are they taking? What are the filters they're using? The biggest thing that concerns me, though, when I think about ESG and I think about impact investing, is that we're using the same language that we use to create the kind of investment portfolios that we've all been involved in over the last number of decades. And we're using similar language, and then we're throwing in some other elements to, you know, change it up to maybe make solve the consciousness and feel good about making money. So I really want to challenge the space to say, how do we actually truly have an impact? Exactly, you know, what um, Kevin was saying, getting your boots dirty, getting on the ground and seeing if your investment is having, you know, that impact. It's no good just putting a label on things saying this is an impact fund, right? Because whenever there's a buzz and whenever there's a lot of energy in a space, there's a lot of, you know, inefficiencies. Let's just say that. You know, so you've got to be really careful. You have to tread 
alongside the people who are on the ground, seeing the impact and making sure that that supply chain of impact is truly happening. And it's not just a buzzword to try and make you feel good about making more, you know? So that's, that's kind of, you know, from my opinion. Very good, very good. And Helena, what is your thought on the present state of the market of impact impact being presented to family offices and institutions? It's kind of the same in uh, alignment with um, what was just said. Um, there's a lot of people reworking their presentations about what they want to raise money on. And um, what how I filter it out is, is it measurable? What impact will it really actually do? You check up on the investment, make sure and have ahead of time before you invest uh, measurements of success. Make sure that it's going to do something uh, to help the world, to help people, to help the environment, whatever the criteria is that is important to you. You have to be able to measure. So um, if there are no uh, structures like that in place, then it's not a worthwhile investment. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Helena. And Joe, what are your thoughts on the, the sort of deal flow uh, that's being presented to you from the marketplace? Do uh, you have confidence in it or uh, do you feel that it's, it's not, not, not showing a specific measure? I'd, I'd love to hear your views. Yeah. You know, we, we, we look at this with the different lenses. You know, we, we, we apply the, the British Scottish philosopher, Adam Smith's philosophy of the invisible hand and making sure that uh, while we're trying to do good, you can't build a sustainable business where serious investors are gonna get involved if it doesn't, it doesn't have a capitalistic mindset basis. You have to have that, and that's the beginning of, of a, a thesis for an investment. The secondary things, which are really the most important, but they're by definition the secondary one, are the ones that really have this, this broader impact, positive impact that we're all talking about. But the first criteria is, is this viable? Is there a buyer? When we make money in first world, maybe in third we don't, but that's maybe the byproduct of how we make the investment. But, but it's gotta be an investment that, that's a viable and it's gonna have an internal rate of return on our investors. And uh, and those are the most successful ones. <clears throat> that are that are high in the sky, that don't have a sustainable economic model and, and a capitalistic format those are the ones that fail. And, mm -hmm. and I, you have to have that as the beginning of any analysis. Thank you, Joe. And Rich, of course, what are your thoughts on the state of the market? I know you've done a lot of analysis here um, of deal flow uh, being presented to you as a family office or at the institutional level. I, I agree with a lot of the previous comments. I would say I have a positive bias on what we're seeing, that this um, ESG triple bottom line impact has achieved a level of awareness and a level of interest. It's really important. It's here to stay. It's sustainable. It's going to be big. But what happens is you have some externalities. You have some froth. You have some situations that aren't really worthy of investing. I'm reminded of uh, Warren Buffett's quote. He had to learn to say no a lot. You have to be disciplined. But I also think the lines were blurring between emerging markets and developed markets because of technology transfers very quickly. And also in some of our venture portfolios, which are not ESG impact focused, we found ourselves in investments like Beyond Meat or in a drone company that's helping deliver healthcare medicine in Africa. So I think that there's a lot of good stuff going on. I have a positive bias, but in our business, we have to continue to say no a lot and what we're really looking for, I would say, I echo Kevin, is focus on people who are really in it, who are focused on adding value at the operating level, not promoters. And I think we'll talk about that in a little while. But anyway, that's my, my perspective. Well, a, a difference as well, by the way, Rich, as well, is, is unlike an institution, a family office have a core values um, and future vision that's very, very specific. And often they invest in the entrepreneur, not necessarily just the structure or the fund or the credibility of this and that money manager. Uh, and that leads into our next question. So how do you as a family office or private investor choose triple bottom line investments that you feel resonate with your core values and vision? What's the decision making process, the risk profile, the structure, the minimum or maximum deal size that you look at 
and the financial and social returns you're targeting. If you could put that into about a, roughly a minute to a minute and a half, Kevin. Uh, you know, we spoke a little bit, but we all seem to have very strong values on this panel. And the real question is to find others that really have similar values but have the ability to execute. That's what we've really been talking about. I always say I always look for a CPO, an inside person and an outside person in every company. And first and foremost, I need a CPO, like the chief passion officer. And that person needs to instill in the entire team the type of passion to get the job done no matter what. And, and second of all, that quality has got to be that you're dynamic. I don't think any of the companies that we founded that truly became successful were, did the same business a year or two later. They listened to the marketplace. They had two ears and one mouth and they adjusted to the marketplace. So we're constantly looking for dynamic CPO with inside people that will keep that CPO in line. Our decision process is we have to be unanimous internally on a part of five people. I also encourage my, my son, for example, he has some independent businesses that are not part of McGovern Capital. He's a foodie, he loves food and beverage. We're into wellness foods, et cetera. And our size of our investments typically, Peter, are anywhere we start with a half a million to a million five. And frankly, we want to make sure we have plenty of fuel to stay on board. And so, and we do not want majority ownership. If you can't invest in that management that you trust to run the ship, uh, to me, minority, we keep our nose in and our hands out. When a crisis comes, we bring our hands in. Thank you very much, Kevin. Helena, what is your criteria in terms of... Uh core values and vision, decision-making process, risk profile, deal size, uh, and the financial and, and social impact returns that you're looking at? Um, I have a high expectations um, in terms of uh, economic return because I've been able to do very well before. And um, I like winners. I like to pick winners. And I, I like to understand and know what happens to a company um, because I have uh, some kind of impact and control over, say, for example, types of customers uh, that they will have. So uh, my risk profile, I'm not very risky. I'm very risk averse because I like to be able to understand all the parts and pieces and how to the roadmap of where this uh, company or this venture will go. And the other one is um, the uh, the impact. It's really easy to uh in my mind, to make money. It is really easy to have uh, technologies. And the some of the technologies that we're uh, involved in are uh, very practical, um, even though they might not sound like it. So you imagine, um, uh, you know, sci-fi movies where there's roadways in the sky for uh, flying vehicles, and in, in this case, uh, flying drones. Well, what does that get you? Um, I, that is a, Economic, there is an, an economic uh, piece to that, but um, if you can, if you're able to direct uh, traffic with this technology, so that you can bring uh, foodstuffs and medicines to people faster and quicker without uh, creating uh, logger uh, jams with uh, you know all these things flying around. So I, I like to invest in fundamental technologies that have the greatest impact. And um, do you so, and, Yes. And do you yeah. guys? What? And deal size, what's the ideal deal size for you? Uh, the ideal deal size has to be somewhere around 50 million or more. And uh, if it becomes more uh, and I can't handle myself, I usually like to co-invest with other people and co-invest with my friends in that it has to mean that they have to add something to it. They're passionate about that uh, area. They have some uh, previous performance or they can bring in, um, you know, governments or whatever it is that the, that particular project needs. So. Brilliant. Excellent. Thank you, Helena. And David, again, uh, just to echo that, that question, I mean, what are your core values and future vision regarding social impact investments? Uh, and what's the decision making process you'd like to share with people here on the risk profile, the structure, yeah, minimum, maximum deal size, you know, uh, as far as the investments you look at uh, and the social impact and financial returns that resonate with you? I'm probably very high on the risk factor because I just take people for who they are. You know, I look at people <laughs> for me. I just look at I look at I look at people with passion. I follow my instincts. I follow my heart and I invest in people. I think it always comes down to people and then it comes down to the culture. Um, exactly what, um, you know, um, what Kevin was saying earlier about passion. I think there's two other pillars that I really sort of believe in, which is purpose 
and play, right? Do you enjoy the space that you're in? Are you actually enjoying what you're doing? Because if you don't enjoy it and you can't tie it in with your passion and you're not doing it with a sense of purpose, um, then, then I'm not, I'm not, I'm not usually connected to it. Um, so for me, I look for that in the team. I look for that in the impact and the way that um, the culture of that company is set up. I look for, you know, some habits. I call these my sort of core habits. I look for curiosity. I look for people who are courageous. I look for optimism. I look for persistence. I look for uh, multiple perspective taking, meaning looking across different um, sectors. Collaboration is, ex is really important for me. Experimentation, evaluation um, of a space and really understanding it. Um, and iterating, being able to kind of change. And, and, and as you say, you know, earlier, it's like no one, everyone starts out with a plan, as Mike Tyson says, um, and then you get punched in the face, right? right. Um, so you have to be able to get back up um, and, and let your ego drop out the way. So for me, I think, um, you know, I, I do very small investments to people who I just believe, uh, uh, you know, have a passionate idea, you know, um, you know, and often that's like, it's investing in that person. And if it comes back, it comes back. And, you know, sometimes I'll invest in things that are a lot bigger, you know, but I mean, my, my usual sweet spots, probably like 250 to a million, something like that in terms of, you know, early stage stuff. Um, I've done some bigger deals, but I usually bring in other players and put teams together around those investments because I'm an individual um, acting in, in, in my own sort of bubble, um, you know, but I, I definitely lead um, on the impact on the team, the heart space, you know, and will I enjoy it? Do I enjoy the people, you know, because you're going to spend a lot of time with those people mentoring those people. Do we get along? Do we like what we do? And can we have fun? And, and, and if we got mm -hmm. locked in a room together, you know, would we end up, you know, slinging each, you know, punches or would we have a dance together, you know? Um, so, you know, that's, that's important to me is the people. Indeed, that's that intangible as well. And that's where those 20 hour work days become uh, a pleasure. Night after night <laughs> yeah. after night. Yeah. And we're all entrepreneurs exactly. here and we've all had a taste of that. Um, yeah. Joe, I'll put the next the, the same question to you as well before we move on um, uh, to, to, to Rich. It's uh, core values and future vision, deal size, uh, the impact and returns, both financial and social. What is your criteria if, if people wanted to do business with you? Well, most of our most of our ventures are primarily driven out of research labs. So we have a model where we um, follow technologies, if you would technologies that have these criteria that we've defined previously. And uh, and then we interact with the scientists, the actual inventors. And what oftentimes happens is, A, they're passionate. I mean, obviously, this is their life's work. Um, they want to see their technologies come to fruition. Um, they keep very core to their values this notion of um, doing good, which is which is really, you need an advocate to always remind you of, of that goal. So what we tend to do is we, we spin out these technologies. We, we keep the inventors as a center focus of the deal. And we do that for multiple multitude of reasons. One is the universities oftentimes want that. Uh, number two, it is an important uh, criteria to really always represent your investment with the people that actually came up with the concept. And then thirdly, they keep you honest. I mean, invent scientists are the most honest people on the face of the earth. Whether you like it or not, they will tell you. So it's always a good reality gut check to have them around. Them. And I tend to really like, um, you know, uh, new scientists. Or for whatever reason, we've been gravitating to deals where the inventions have kind of come out of really young scientists. Um, they're so different. They're so paradigm shifting from what the, the history of that particular disease area or study uh, involves that they're truly, either they're crazy or they're pa or oil change the world. That's how we do it. So we like to take those risks um, because I'm heavily involved in these deals. And, and, and in summary, what, what is the deal yeah, size, Joe? Because I'm involved in these deals, I usually, uh, we will allocate between half a million to two million. Beyond that, then we go out and seek uh, either private venture capital or family capital. Okay, brilliant, thank you, Joe. <clears throat> And Rich, okay, I don't need to repeat the question. I'm sure I've saved, maybe I'm saving the best for last. Share your views on uh, deal size, the impact returns you're looking for, and how people could do business with you. We um, <clears throat> are not gener generally investing at the real seed stage. We're coming in a little bit later, preferably the seed extension or even the A, B round. We think that's a sweet spot where we can see that the product is already largely defined, that the technology risk is manageable, 
we're not investing in pure technology. We're investing in people who have solutions that are technology enabled. I, I would echo what everyone else said. Our check size is between half a million and say 3 million. Uh, we could go more, but that's a comfortable level. But it's really about underwriting the team. And the team uh, has to have the domain expertise. They have to have the grit. We like people who listen, that they're in charge. There's no confusion of our role or their role, but they're prepared to listen, which enables them to adjust if they see something. They're not so locked in on what they're doing. And we also are looking for a, a functional governance structure because what we've seen sometimes is passionate entrepreneurs, they bring in other people who have different ideas and it could be the other people they bring in that screw it up. So we want a functional governance structure where we know who's really running the show and um, we're, we're measuring social impact like uh, like Helena said, but you know we're looking for people who are, who are doers. People are not talking about it, but they're already running to do. Those are the people that succeed. Th thank you, Rich. Okay, and we'll, we'll make it sort of short and sharp for these, so 30 seconds to a minute max uh, for some of these. But for this one, let us I'll just put it out just generally. You're all welcome to chime in. What are red flags that will tell you as being mere promotional hype and greenwashing by investment managers and, promotion, uh, and uh, promoters? Kevin, in 30 seconds. Uh, basically financial, social, and, and boots. Basically, I'm not looking for mercenaries. I'm looking for missionaries. I can't stand I people. I like we people. I don't like they people. I like we people and us. And just yesterday, I was seriously considering investment, but they used the word I about 30 times in the presentation. No way. Team, team, basically, <laughs> that's a red flag. Financial sophistication. You live in Spain the next 30 years, you learn Spanish. You're going to be in business, you better learn accounting, or else somebody's going to steal a lot of money from you. You're an inside guy who counts our pennies, and an outside guy who knows how to, how to spend it carefully. And lastly, I'm looking at the pillow partners. I want, to, I want to try to find out, if I can, what kind of family people these are and what kind of social people these are in the rest of their lives. I see values. That's a big plus. Right, David? Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, I think it's everything you've just said, Kevin, is spot on. Um, you know, it's turning nowness into niceness as well. I mean, for me, a lot of patience, right? Realizing that nobody's as smart as everybody. The only way we get to where we're going to be is by understanding that we have to bring in people. We have to bring in people with knowledge. We have to share ideas. We have to, you know... Um, you have to have a certain amount of ego for sure the, to be to be an entrepreneur, to believe in yourself, right? To, to believe that the thing that you're dreaming about, that unlocking that human potential is possible. But I, I, I get put off by the sort of the I as well. You know, I, I get put off by the sort of sense that it's I'm going to want to change the world. It, it, it's not going to be one person. It's going to be all of us working together collectively to fly Spaceship Earth. And, and, and it's got to be a team player who thinks like that. Um, so that I, I'm, I'm in that I'm in the same camp as Kevin. Yeah. Okay. So, anyone else uh, have any uh, thoughts on red? I would, I would say for, again, I would echo the the, the jockey concept. Flags. Uh, yep. that at the end of the day, you're 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 investing in the jockey. Um, it's always good to have a good <laughs> jockey, and you can always take the race course, right? But the jockey has to be critical, and uh, we invest in jockey. Mm -hmm. It's all okay. about teams. It's all about teams for me. Kevin, you said it just right. You have to have the right team. We don't. We personally do not have enough time to do, do these things, and we need to find the teams that will actually do. Mm -hmm. Rich, any thoughts, or is it ditto? I, I don't. I, I think it's been well said. Okay, brilliant. Well, look, um, as a special insight for all of our audience here at Arasis, in 30 seconds, and keep this nice, short, and sharp, if you had to pick one or maximum two investments or sectors in any geographic location, any sector anywhere in the world that you feel will be the most successful in terms of return and or greatest triple bottom line social impact in the coming, say, three to five years, what investment sector or opportunity would that be? And what is your reason for having confidence in this? Uh, Kevin, 30 seconds. We're on, I'm on the board and part of a company that treats the core problem of COVID, heart disease, Alzheimer's, diabetes, and cancer. That's inflammation and plaque. Plaque is a $2 trillion industry, vascular diseases, and we're the first drug to eliminate plaque. We're in phase two on many different applications. The company is called Revin. It's in Colorado. 
Do you want any more? Second, I now have signed a contract with one of the largest media companies in the U.S. to bring health care into your home for Main Street, not concierge, for the masses. And so the media markets in the U.S., and we want to bring health care to grandma, grandpa, at home, minorities, et cetera. And we want to use Thank you. and media to help the health care of the masses, period. Thank you, Kevin. Okay, in 30 seconds, uh, David, uh, that one maximum two investments that you think uh, could be a big winner in three to five years and its, uh, its impact. I mean, for me, it's just nature systems, right? I'm just looking at how technology mm -hmm. can support the natural environment to allow us to live on this planet. So I look at emerging markets now. I look at the ocean. I look at, um, you know, or emerging countries where um, the natural systems are under huge pressure and helping them and investing in places where, you know, the, the make sure that they don't make the same mistakes that we've made in the, the overdeveloped world. Um, and, and we help them develop um, sensible, smart solutions that keep nature in, in, in the system and not outside of the system. Brilliant. Joe, in 30 seconds, one maximum of two investments that you think are going to be winners in the social impact space. I think I think the, in, the investments that make the most sense are the ones that have broader implications. Uh, I believe in vaccines and antibiotics. They have really altered the path of humanity, and I think that those will continue to be an important investment moving forward. Okay, Rich? I have two. <clears throat> One is we're very passionate about health and wellness in the United States, personalized medicine, and wearable devices that allow people to have information to monitor their health. And the second is solar power and solar power management in emerging markets. I think that the, especially in the Southern Hemisphere in Africa and Latin America, the technology is available and it can change communities and change people's lives. Thank you, Rich. And Helena, in 30 seconds, one maximum two investments you think are going to be hot going forward? Uh, digitization, um, being able to create those fundamental uh, technologies to roll out across sectors that will impact uh products to uh, uh, medicines and so forth. Um, I look for the picks and shovels businesses. The other one is decon, decontam decontamination agents for the mass user market. Um, you know, sanitize your hands, but not kill the earth in the meantime. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty, pretty yeah. amazing. Um, so that's what we've been working on for the last year. That's phenomenal. Great. Well, look, I'd love to thank uh, all of my distinguished panelists. Uh, we could go on and on and on. There's many other questions I'd love to ask, and our audience are also very receptive. But we're going to have to take this to uh, an unfortunate uh, conclusion. But definitely, this is uh, a discussion I'm sure we're all going to continue to take together and in alliance with our and many great friends uh, at Harassus as part of their growing community. Um, so in summary, you, everyone in the audience now, can look back and feel that they've gained some very unique perspectives from, from several world-class triple bottom line social impact investments, investors and experts with very differing backgrounds, perspectives and views. You've gained a greater insight into the pivotal role family offices play in the social impact and triple, triple bottom line investment world, how family offices choose the investments that align with their core values and vision, what red flags repel them as being mere promotional hype and greenwashing by investment managers and promoters, and that special insight into that one specific investment that they feel is going to be a winner going into the future. We strongly encourage all of our distinguished audience to take action with the tremendous knowledge and insights that have been presented here today by these world experts. Uh, and interactivity and collaboration is strongly encouraged by the Harassus community, which has made them successful over so many years. Therefore, any further thoughts, questions or insights, uh, you're welcome to share with Harassus directly. Myself via email at inquiries with an E, inquiries at ATOS Investments, A-E-T-O-S Investments.com by LinkedIn, Peter J.R. Aylwin, or our website, which is being revamped, uh, but will be live again shortly, is uh, atosinvestments.com, or our distinguished panelists via their social media um, or the uh, details provided in their bios. Ladies and gentlemen, these uncertain times and a most exciting rest of the day. And Frank Jürgen Richter, chairman of uh, Harassus, a great big thank you for making this 
uh, possible through your continued dedication and support. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank Goodbye. You. Thank you. You run a really good tip. Yeah. yeah. You just I make sure to show up sharp. I, I, I had the option. Yeah. Hello? Thanks, Peter. Just, we all have contact information. Yeah, um, what I'll do, I'll, yeah, exactly. Um, I, 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 I sent a group email in, the, in, in, in before that you, you all have access to. So, yes, that, that should be there. I assume this is being cut off. It says live, but um, I, assume, I assume we're not live. So this is off the record. <laughs> that was great. Thank you, Peter. Thank you very much. Yeah, I, 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 if I had an hour, I would have given those extra questions on um, uh, uh, direct investments versus co-investments, how you would align with uh, technology, the role of technology, uh, the role of governments and how they can back you up. Because a real big part of my sort of focus and interest on this is, of course, how to back up the initial investors and entrepreneurs. But again, um, that's something we can save for a longer discussion uh, and maybe change the world amongst ourselves, right? Thank you very it much. It makes such a difference, uh, Peter, you. that you prepared because uh, some some of these things they are not prepared and makes such a big difference. Thank you. I agree, Elena. Nice meeting you, very good Rich meeting and you. Elena, and I hope we can communicate. I, yeah, I'd All like right. that. We'll do. I'll, I'll set up a group email. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Have a great day. And have a great day. Thank you. Okay, buddy.